Masyalinejad is a prominent and internationally active critic of the Iranian regime. A journalist and activist, she left Iran in 2009 for the United States, where she currently lives. Here in Berlin, to commemorate the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, she learned that U.S. authorities had again foiled an attempt ordered by the Iranian regime to assassinate her. Together with her, we discussed the dangers of being an outspoken critic of the Iranian regime and what she thinks Western countries should do to support women in Iran. Masilina Judd, thank you very much for joining us at DW today. Now, you were here in Berlin when you heard from U.S. authorities that they had carried out arrests of people involved in another plot to assassinate you. It's not the first one involving also the regime in Iran. How does that make you feel? To be honest, first I was shocked, but now I'm angry because this has been like uh, the third attempt in my life. The first was a kidnapping plot. The FBI charged four people. Then the FBI arrested a man from Azerbaijan, a criminal, with AK-47 in front of my house in Brooklyn, waiting for me to kill me. And I thought, OK, finally, I'm going to be safe. But it shows that the, the word safe is too luxury for those of us who dare to challenge the Islamic Republic. So then I heard from the FBI as soon as I arrived in Berlin that they arrested two other men. And um, it was quite scary as well because I read the indictment that the two men who were assigned to kill me, um, they were actually taking pictures of the university, Fairfield University, which I was supposed to go there and give a talk about my campaign against compulsory veiling. And the two killers spent many times in front of my house, which I'm not even there. I've been moved to 21 safe houses. But it seems that they're really determined to, to kill me. So I'm happy I'm alive. Does that make you in any way think again about what you're doing, about your, your activism, about your, your fight? Uh, against the regime or does it give you more strength? How does that make you feel? Uh, first of all, I have to say the person who was assigned to hire the killers in New York, that was the same person, Farhad Chakiri, who was assigned to kill President Trump. So that actually shows you something that the Islamic Republic, the mullahs with weapons, guns and bullets, they scared women like me the same level that they scared the President of the United States of America. So that gives me hope. That actually makes me more determined to fight them back. And uh, my heroes are women in front line in Iran, losing their eyes, but not losing their hope. The mothers of those who got killed, but now they became the voice of their daughters, their sons, and saying that we're not going to give up. We will bring the wall of dictatorship down. And you know what? It is very emotional for me. I, I came here to celebrate the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The anniversary is here. So I was here uh, by the invitation of the city, uh, actually Springer. I was trying to talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I was like, wow, this is the moment actually showing you that there are many walls, walls of oppression everywhere in my country, Iran, Afghanistan, everywhere. And we have to fight them back because the women inside the countries, they're facing the same killers every day. So I'm being protected, but they don't have any protections, but they're still fighting. So I will be louder to fight against them. Do you feel that people like you who have left Iran um, are being protected enough from the, by the countries where they're now living? To be honest, in America, yes. The law enforcement, uh, the FBI, I'm very pleased that they protected me. But I have to say that um, Jamshid Sharmat was kidnapped the way that the Iranian regime actually were planning to kidnap me. Ruhollah Zam, uh, a French citizen, was kidnapped as well. So German citizen, French citizen. It just breaks my, he my heart that why? They, they should have been alive, like me now, but they lost their lives. Recently, Jamshid was executed. Ruhollah, the father of two children was executed as well. So I think it's not about me. There are many dissidents and journalists and activists living in Germany, living in the United States of America, living everywhere. They need the same level of protection as well. So for me, 
I have to say that I have no fear for my life, but I believe transnational repression is uh, like became a tool in the hand of uh, dictators like Russia, China, Islamic Republic to target freedom of speech, the Western values, the national security of the Western countries. And that should be protected. I'm, I'm pleased to be protected, but I want the Western countries to protect democracy. Now, speaking of Jamshi Shamad, uh, a dual Iranian German national who was recently executed in Iran, uh, we've heard from his daughter, members of his family, but also from other activists that um, there is a feeling that Germany didn't do enough to try yes. to save his life and, and get him out. What do you think should have been done? What could have Germany done to actually secure his, his life? Germany didn't show any sign to the Islamic Republic when Jamshid Sharmat was on death row. Because that was the moment that they should have actually put pressure on Islamic Republic, downgrade their diplomatic relation with the hostage takers and get him out from prison. Now I see finally, finally Germany taking step and, uh, steps and, and they sh uh, shut down three consulates. But it's too late, too late, because they could have done that before. The US government as well. I'm allowed to criticize the U.S. government as well because he was in the death row as a Ger German and American citizen. So the U.S. government handed out $6 billion, but they didn't bring the only American citizen who was on the death row. I mean, my heart is broken because I could have been Jamshid Sharmat. When they kidnapped him, my picture was everywhere saying, next is Masi Alinejad. So it could have been me, it could have been you, it could have been any of us that the German government, the US government could save his life. They didn't. When I was here with Kosar Iftikhari, with Sima Murad Begi, with m women who lost their eyes during Women Life Freedom Uprising, the foreign minister refused to meet with us. But the same foreign minister saying that uh, the German foreign policy is based on feminism, uh, meet with the Ayatollahs, meet with the foreign minister of the Islamic Republic. And today I see actually one of the journalists interviewed the foreign minister of the Islamic Republic and he claimed that, you know, it's okay. I mean, and now we have to continue our relation, diplomatic relation. What kind of diplomatic relation? The Islamic Republic doesn't understand the language of diplomacy. Only one language they understand, language of pressure isolate them, otherwise they're going to go after more German citizens and they will kill more innocent people like Jamshid Sharma. But do you really think that actually not speaking to the regime at all would have actually brought out someone like Jamshid Sharma? Uh, how would have been possible? We've heard uh, his daughter, for example, uh, calling for a prisoner exchange on the style that happened recently with uh, political prisoners and journalists in Putin's Russia. Uh, on the one hand, is that also not a risk of basically incentivizing uh, Iran and taking more people as hostages, basically, arresting them and then asking for something in return uh, from the West? That's a very good question. My brother was a hostage in the hand of this barbaric regime. My heart was broken because I was asked to compromise, to keep quiet in order to see my brother free. It was difficult for me. I didn't do that. Instead, I became louder and giving, like, you know, speeches and going everywhere and talking against them. That's how I got my brother free from prison. So I'm just an ordinary woman. I'm not in power. But the powerful leaders, the US government, the UK government, German government, French government, government across the globe, they have dual national citizens in prison. Imagine a day all these leaders get united and send a signal to the Islamic Republic downgrading the diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic, saying that you have to free all the dual national citizens, you have to free all the innocent political prisoners. That's how you take the hostage out from prison. With handing out money, basically you're telling the Iranian regime, okay, go after more you know, US citizens, more German citizens, because this is how you can make money and you can go after more um, you know, hostages. This is the hostage-taking diplomacy. And I have a simple question. If your neighbors raping their daughters, their sisters, their boys and girls, their children, what would you do? You give them money? You go and negotiate with them? No, you call the police. 
This is the regime raping teenagers, raping women, raping innocent prisoners. Don't negotiate with them. Make them accountable. That's how the whole world got united when the apartheid in South Africa was in power, isolated them. That's how the unity helped the wall of the Berlin to fall. So what is the difference between gender apartheid regime and the gender, like the, the apartheid here in South Africa? Or the Berlin Wall was a symbol of tyranny, oppression. So the Islamic Republic is the same. So we have to understand that negotiation is not going to get us everywhere. Two decades, Germany has spent the resources of German people, the taxpayers, to negotiate with the government. What have you achieved? Nothing. Now the time has come. Close the, war, the, the doors of diplomacy toward dictators and open the doors toward people. Uh, we know that the German government now wants to push for uh, more sanctions against Iran, and in particular they want to try to the, the EU to classify the Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization and apply terrorist sanctions. Do you think that could have an impact on the regime, also given the big economic influence of the Revolutionary Guard in the country? Absolutely, because the Revolutionary Guards are not there to support me, to support Kosar, to support Nahid Chirpiche, to support Nargis Mohammadi. I, I get goosebumps because these are not just statistics. They are in prison because the Revolutionary Guards putting them in pressure and bullying them, shooting against innocent people. Revolutionary Guards is the same group that's sending money to Hamas, to Houthi in Yemen, to Hezbollah, sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. How come the democratic countries putting the Wagner group of Russia in the terrorist list, but when it comes to the biggest ally of Wagner group, Putin, they suddenly say that, ah, oh, let's just negotiate with them. We want the leaders of democratic countries to be as united as dictators, as Putin and Khamenei, China, Venezuela. All the dictators are backing each other, supporting each other, voting for each other, providing technology surveillance, weapons, money, military, everything. But the democratic countries, no. Like the US government, Canada, they designated Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, but Germany hesitated. France, they are still hesitating to do this. And I want the feminist foreign policy Stop being Ayatollah's policy. You can help Iranian women and classify the Islamic Republic and Taliban as gender apartheid in all international law. Half of the population in Afghanistan, in Iran, are being like second class citizens. They're not allowed to go to school. They're not allowed to show their hair. They're not allowed to talk. We're not allowed to sing. This is called gender apartheid and we have to end gender apartheid. Otherwise, the dictators will get united and they will end democracy, equality, feminism, freedom everywhere here in Germany as well. Now, um, uh, last year you, uh, you were in Berlin and you canceled a meeting with an official of the foreign uh, ministry here in Berlin because uh, you said you were requested to keep quiet about the meeting and about what was discussed in this meeting. The foreign ministry said that they normally do this to basically provide a safe space uh, for people to discuss things freely. What is, uh, have you had any contact with the German government since then? Uh, have you spoken to anyone at the foreign ministry? Of course, because I never give up. I'm a woman from Iran. I carry the wounds and scars of an oppressive regime always pushing us back, saying no to us. We never give up. So I again reached out to the foreign minister for another meeting. So um, from her office, they promised me that in next visit. So I still want to meet with the foreign minister and German government. I had the pleasure to meet with the president and uh, the mayor here. I'm very pleased because Berlin is the city of freedom, city of hope for many of dissidents like, uh, like me and, and dissidents like, like they, they never have the opportunity to express themselves. So I'm still hopeful that one day we can sit down and find the solution to stick together. I, I strongly believe that people like me, uh, people like Nargis Mohammadi, the Nobel Prize winner who's in prison, like dissidents, we are better allies for German people compared to these backward mullahs. The foreign minister of Germany had a meeting with the foreign minister of Islamic Republic. So they take some of the female politicians in the West, they take pictures with Taliban. Then how come you want 
to take pictures with them, but not with us because it's, you want to us to give us safe space. Safe space for us is to show your solidarity, to show your sisterhood, and proudly stand shoulder to shoulder with the women of Iran and Afghanistan who say no to dictatorship. Azilina Jad, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your uh, platform.